Welcome everyone. I'm really glad to have you all with us. Uh, thanks for joining this experimental confluence of UCI humanities research and also UCI public health and the regional medical partners and also South Asian communities and organizations in the area. I also want to welcome some of my students in Jain studies class as well as cross cultural medical ethics from this quarter. Uh, my name is Brian Donaldson. I'm Associate Professor of Religious Studies and South Asian Philosophies, and I'm also glad to hold the Sri Parshvanath Presidential Chair in Jain Studies here at UCI. By way of a land acknowledgement, we just invite you to consider now and in the days ahead how the lands that you live on are animate, vibrant, full of life, and full of life-giving power. How do the lands that you live on care for you? And what will you do to care for them? May such practices of reanimation open paths toward greater co-flourishing of all peoples, animals, plants, and ecosystems. Our program today is gonna to unfold with a few short welcomes, two longer presentations from One Legacy Organ Procurement Organization here in Southern California. And then we'll be learning about the Jain Hindu Organ Donation Alliance in the United Kingdom. Our aim is to have about a half hour at the end to get to as many questions as possible. I also want to thank Dwayne Pack, who is the head of IT in the School of Humanities, and also Michelle Spivey, who's our administrator for religious studies, for um, your expertise and support. Thank you both. Also, I want to thank our co-sponsors, UCI Religious Studies, UCI Center for Health Ethics at WEN Public Health, UCI Center for Medical Humanities, Anikant Community Center, and a Parigraha Foundation. And with that, I want to now welcome Dr. Nitin Shah, an anesthesiologist at Loma Linda University, representing the Jain community of Southern California, to offer a brief welcome. And Michelle, could you please put the chat for Anikant Community Center in the chat now? Uh, rather, the link uh, for Anikant Community Center in the chat. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shah, and I'll get your slides started. Thank you very much, uh, Brianne. Um, appreciate this opportunity, and more importantly, it is so wonderful that uh, UCI and you have taken up this uh, task. Uh, uh, my personal involvement has goes back in South Asian organ and uh, blood donation many many years. Uh, I've been doing uh, free community health fairs here since 1995. I have worked with South Asian uh, Network and Sahara and other South Asian organizations. Why do we have to worry about organ donation in this community? Next. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so there's a shortage of organ donors. And as we know, you have to have a match within your community to find an organ for your needs. Next. So if you look at just blood donations in India, Demand for blood is 36.3 per thousand, availability is 33.8, and so that leads to a million units of blood shortage every year just in India. And this is probably worse in some of the neighboring countries, next like Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. Coming back to the organ donation challenge. Educated people are more aware of organ shortages and that's kind of minority communities need more organs due to increased rates of diabetes, high blood pressure and heart disease. So the need is higher and availability education awareness is less. Religion, Islamic faith, and also there is part of Buddhist faith who restrict organ donations. 68% of South Asians agreed that it is necessary, but only 13% were registered. Gender, 80% were women, and yet only 19% women got it. United Kingdom, South Asians comprise 3% of disease donors, but made up of 15% of disease donor transplants, and 18% of the transplant waiting list. Next. So comparing with other countries, 0.2 per million population diseased organ donation rate in Bangladesh compared to Spain, 47.9. And Spain, of course, ranked the highest in the world. Pakistan voluntary blood donation, 5%. 
while UK 80 to 90 percent. In India, living donor kidney transplant 88 percent, USA 42 percent. Thanks. Next. So why are South Asians poor organ donors? And three most common cause I alluded to before, but giving you some percentage, 80% reasons are that they're not aware. 63% religious beliefs and superstitions. Yes, superstitions play a very important role, unfortunately on a bad side in uh, rural areas and lack of faith in healthcare system. Uh, there are issues, there are challenges that the organs which are given are not appropriately uh, transported and given to the organs, uh, donors, etc. And the faith in the healthcare system is less. Next. So, I personally believe that giving organs and giving blood is the easiest way anybody can help someone and the need remains high. And I believe that if you want to be happy in life, if you, can able, if you are able to serve someone whom you do not know, you'll get the true happiness. True happiness comes from serving an unknown. Giving blood is the most easiest way you can donate something. And you know, one unit of blood can save eight lives. Thank you very much. Appreciate Brian for asking me to start this. I am looking forward to presentations from everybody else here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I would just like to take a few minutes to briefly frame our time. A 1993 British, British government short film, only about 40 seconds, you can see it here, the organ donor box, features South Asian nurses and doctors rushing an organ cooler down the hall to a waiting patient while South Asian family members sit in the waiting room. Preserved in the British Film Institute's National Archive, these few seconds conjure the kind of handheld camera urgency of organ donation, even as it also offers a cultural artifact of South Asians playing a critical role in encouraging fellow citizens to sign up for organ donor cards. Today, however, organ donor cards are not needed in the United Kingdom. Beginning in 2015 to 2023, Wales, followed by Scotland, England, and Northern Ireland, all adopted legislation to become opt-out countries, meaning that all adults are now considered potential organ donors unless they choose to opt out or are in an excluded group due to their age, mental capacity, or new residency status. The US, however, where the need for organs, stem cells, and bone marrow is even greater, remains an opt-in country. This means that the barrier to becoming a donor is higher and steeper, even as the need is more expansive. Some years ago, when I was conducting research for my co-authored book, Insistent Life, Principles for Bioethics in the Jain Tradition, I came across the work of the Jain Hindu Organ Donation Alliance in the UK. Since a small part of my research involved looking at Jain attitudes to organ donation, I was struck by this dynamic organization, which was spearheaded by a Jain Hindu steering committee from diaspora communities. It had such a strong online presence, beautiful website, video testimonials, and a growing list of outreach and collaboration events with the UK's National Health Service. So on one hand, my research in South Asian bioethics generally, including a survey of giant medical professionals specifically, got me wondering if something similar could take root among North American South Asian communities who were often already linked in social service and medical service organizations across the US and Canada. And on the other hand, I'm also the sister of an organ donor. In 1998, my brother who was then 23 years old took his own life. Because he was able to be hospitalized straight away, three of his organs could be donated and two were successful transplants. Through the Gift of Life program, um, our family was able to hear from these two recipients who reached out to us. And the fact that death comes from life is no consolation, nor is it a trade-off for loss 
and grief, which are, in my experience, lifetime companions. But it's a remarkable fact of technology and biology and kinship that the body of one can preserve the life of another. While donation and transplants can happen across race, across ethnicity and gender lines, some patients may find a better match from the same ethnic background. And today, nearly 60% of people on US transplant waiting lists come from minority communities. So through the Jane Chair at UCI, which is a campus that has both a strong focus on humanities research, as well as STEM disciplines, including a school of public health and a medical school, it seemed that this was a meaningful coalescence of several factors leading to today as the first event to explore future activities to build the donor community uh, broadly and also the South Asian and minority communities of donors in North America specifically. With that, I want to welcome Sid Anwar, who will offer brief remarks about the national effort that he is part of to build the stem cell and bone marrow registry, which offers another example for us to consider together. Uh, Michelle, could you please put the link for the National Marrow Donor Program in the chat? And to all of our uh, visitors today, as you have questions, you can look at the bottom of your screen and see a little Q&A box. Please click on that box whenever a question arises for you and put it there. <laughs> and at the end of our time, uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as, um, as we can. Uh, I'll stop slide, uh, my share now and get your slides up, uh, Mr. Anwar. Okay. And welcome to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Professor Donaldson. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, esteemed panel to discuss uh, how we can all save lives. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's get to the next slide, please. Uh, my daughter, uh, Lina, was born and raised in Orange County. She graduated from the UCLA. And she was very creative, uh, outgoing, inquisitive, and somebody who loved to travel. And so when she said she wanted to be a journalist, it didn't surprise me. But I did ask her, why do you want to be a journalist? And he said, Dad, I like to make a difference. And difference she did. She worked for NPR, StoryCorps, and Los Angeles Times. And in December of 2018, she was diagnosed with leukemia. She was unable to find a matching stem cell donor for a transplant. And after a 15 month courageous battle with uh, leukemia, she passed away in uh, March of 2020 at an early age of 30. Next, please. I'm sure most of you uh, know someone who has cancer, had cancer or have died of cancer. In the US, every three minutes, somebody is diagnosed with blood cancer. In every 10 minutes, somebody dies of blood cancer. The best cure for blood cancer is a stem cell transplant. There's a worldwide registry of about 40 million uh, donors, but unfortunately, 3% of them are minorities, which includes we South Asians. Next, please. As I said, Lina's cure was a stem cell transplant. It's very difficult to find a matching donor because only one person in the world and if you're lucky, maybe two people in the world could match with you. And of course, uh, the minorities being less than 3%, it makes it much more difficult to find a matching donor. Team Lina conducted stem cell drives in 2019 while she was alive in US, Canada, UK, Australia, and India. And we registered about 12,000 donors in less than four months. Still, we could not find a match for her. But fortunately to date, about 19 of her friends who had registered for her have matched with somebody else to save precious lives. Next, please. Our mission is you know, to continue what Lina started from her hospital bed. And in her honor, we have formed the Team Lina uh, Team Lina uh, or Stem Cell Donation Program and our goal and is mission is to save lives of cancer patients by recruiting more donors and to increase awareness so that we can have more donors into the database. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the solution to this, as I said, is to register as many people as we can 
of all ethnic backgrounds so we can find a match and save lives. The registration process is very simple and it's all free. All you need to be in the ages of 18 to 40 years old and in good health. And all we need is two cheek swabs that are sent to the registry agency NMDP and you get into the database. You could also register by texting team liner to 61474. Sorry, the slide is wrong there, but it is 61474. Thank you. Next, please. Again, uh, once you register, you just sit there in the registry and one 500 may be called to donate their stem cells. Some of them, as a, as a matter of fact, 90% of them are stem cells and 10% could be asked to donate bone marrow. This depends on the doctor's decision. Everything is fully confidential and follows all the federal guidelines. There's no cost to register, uh, as I said, and it's no cost to, and it doesn't cost anything to donate. NMDP pays for everything, not only for you, but for a companion. That includes travel cost, uh, hotel accommodations, uh, lost wages, pet care, child care, everything, because you're the only person probably that match with somebody and they definitely want to have you. Our goal as Team Lina is that one day, every patient will have a matching donor. And I hope uh, we can look forward to a lot of people registering uh, into the registry. Next slide, please. How you can help, you can, everybody can join the registry. You can ask your family and friends to register. You can contact me if you have any additional information that you need. And of course you have a good opportunity to save lives and make a difference. What I say normally is the power to save lives not in your hands, but it's in your cheeks. And I say it in several different colors. Hopefully one of the colors you like and you will decide to register into the stem cell registry. Next, please. Again, there's a little bit of contact information which I hope Professor Donaldson can include into the chat so that uh, if you need to contact, you can do that uh, at this phone number or by email address. Again, it's very simple. Text team line at 61714. Thank you, Professor Donaldson. Thank you so much, Mr. Amwar. And it's good to be here together, um, all of us remembering the life and legacy of Lina that continues today in your work uh, through your great love for her. Thank you. Now I wanna welcome Dr. Adam Kendall, a palliative care physician and Stephen Chow, the Community Partnership Specialist, both with One Legacy, the Organ Procurement Organization here in Southern California, also the largest in the nation. Michelle, can you put the link for One Legacy and also the One Legacy donor registration link in the chat? And for attendees, just a reminder that as you have questions, as we're listening uh, to our speakers, you can just add your questions into the Q&A box. And as we uh, get to that uh, part of our time together, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, welcome very much, Dr. Kendall, Stephen Chow. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Chow. I'm a uh, public education and community partnership specialist here at One Legacy. And here I have Dr. Adam Kendall. Nice to meet everybody. Um, just first off, uh, thank you, Dr. Donaldson, for you know putting together um, this forum for all of us to get together. And thank you to all the uh, presenters as well. Um, I'm going to you know, start off sharing a little bit about One Legacy and some of the uh, um, community outreach that we do here to kind of raise awareness in our communities ab about the power of, you know, becoming an organ donor. And then Dr. Kendall will go more into the process of, you know, the, I guess, the donation process. So to kick it off, uh, One Legacy, save, our, our mission here at One Legacy is to save and heal lives through organ, eye, and tissue donation. We comfort the families that we serve and we inspire our communities to donate life. We serve as a bridge between donors and recipients, and we also serve as a bridge to life, or we serve as a bridge for hospitals to transplant centers. So One Legacy is part of a national organ donation network made up of 57 federally designated nonprofits. Uh, we are sanctioned by the, um, by, by the US Congress, and we serve millions of Southern Californians. Our main job kind of falls into three buckets. The first is educating our communities about the importance of organ donation. The second is advocating our communities to register and get authorization for donation. And our third is to facilitate organ, eye, and tissue donation, thus saving thousands of lives 
a year. So we, so here at One Legacy, we serve one of the largest and most diverse regions in the nation. Um, in One Legacy, we cover seven different counties here in Southern California, ranging from Santa Barbara, Kern, Ventura, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Riverside, and of course, Orange County. Across seven different counties, that's about 20 million residents that we serve. And we work very close, oh, and across the 20 million residents, the majority of them identify as non-white. Um, it's very diverse across these seven counties. And within our service area, we work closely with over 200 regional hospitals and with nine regional transplant centers, such as um, the Loma Linda University. Um, so let's talk a little bit about organ and tissue donation. So less than 1% of hospital deaths will meet the criteria for organ donation after death, but a single donor can save up to eight lives through organ donation. A single donor can also restore the site for two people and also save or improve the lives of 75 people through tissue donation. Uh, the incredible generosity of organ donors and their families offers a gift that could save a neighbor, a parent, or a friend. So here are some of the organs and tissues that can be donated, um, which includes the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, intestine, pancreas. Also for tissues, your cornea, tendons, valves, veins, skin, and bones. So the organ transplant waiting list has more than 100,000 people waiting for a life-saving life transplant. Um, as mentioned you know, by the previous presenters, about 60% about of the people on the national transplant waiting list uh, are, from are from communities of color. Uh, specifically in the Asian Pacific Islander community, 8% um, uh, of APIs are on the waiting list. Um, so, and I, and I believe in 2023, we had about 803 donors from um, Asian Pacific Islander backgrounds, which enabled nearly 3,000 transplants. So that 8% of Asians on the transplant waiting list equates to about 9,500 Asian Pacific Islanders in the United States waiting for a transplant. Nearly 50% of Asian Pacific Islanders on the wait list actually live here in California. So that's why it's important for us, you know, here at One Legacy to have a robust outreach campaign to connect with di different communities, to educate them about the importance of becoming a registered donor. And we do this by, you know, you know, getting out of the community, participating in various events, events such as comedy nights, um, pride events and community festivals, uh, award shows and galas, tabling events, uh, whether it's health fairs or community fairs, just to have a presence to engage with uh, different people that may come by so we can educate them and register them. Uh, we'll participate in parades. We have a Rose Parade float at the upcoming you know, Rose Parade. So check that out on the new year. And of course, uh, we will do school presentations as well, reaching out to university students and also um, high school students as well, because they're the ones that are gonna be getting their driver's licenses and we like to educate them ahead of time, right before so. So when they go to the DMV, they can check that box off and get that pink dot on their, um, the, the pink donor dot on their driver's license. So as I mentioned, uh, cons consent is granted either in advance through the Donate Life California Registry, and you can don't and you can register you know, via the DMV or uh, through One Legacy as well. Uh, we typically have QR codes on a lot of our you know handouts and collateral. And another way that consent is granted is you know through family if death is imminent. And I just want to mention that one person can create a life saving legacy. Um, the decision to donate is confidential and recipients will likely not meet donor families who gave during a time of loss. And, you know, by offering one's organs after death, one can contribute to the well-being of others, reducing suffering and promoting compassion. Uh, donating organs may be seen as a way of helping others while not being over, overly attached to one's physical form. And the act of donation can be viewed as a form of selfless giving and contributing to the welfare of others in the present. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kendall. 
Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Brianne Donaldson, for inviting us to uh, uh, speak to uh, Jane Cultural and Religious Studies students. I, I want to uh, just um, provide some demystification, if you will, about how donation occurs at the time uh, we have um, lost our lives in the situation that um, uh, we have that opportunity to give of life. But um, uh, first, if I may, I'd like to just share uh, something personal. I was really moved uh, by Dr. Um, Shah uh, sharing the benefits of stem cell uh, donation, bone marrow donation, and uh, his um, uh, legacy uh, story as well about his daughter. And I, um, I'm actually a registered stem cell donor. I went to City of Hope because I was close to being a match and had a procedure. And so um, I just want to promote uh, donation overall uh, because um, like um, Professor Donaldson shared, um, the lands are animate. They're vibrant and full of life-saving power. And there's so much truth to that. And we we will not be here, uh, but the lands will be um, in 100 years. And I think that um, for us to think about how we can still produce a change in the world around us is uh, very pertinent to um, the, uh, the, the idea of um, life-saving donation. Dr. Shaw, um, I learned something from your presentation as well. Uh, only 13% of Southeast Asians are registered, and this is in contrast to 54% of Americans nationwide. And I think uh, you're right. It, there is a lot of complexity to uh, the underlying cause, and I'm so glad that you're sharing with the students the different aspects. It's not just religious. It's, it's not just lack of, of medical knowledge. Uh, but I'd like to share my story um, very briefly because uh, November 25th is the day that my late wife passed away on Thanksgiving day in 2011. And uh, like um, Professor Donaldson, she had taken her own or, or, or Professor Donaldson's family member. Um, my late wife did take her own life. Uh, she was a physician and uh, she was a Buddhist. Uh, both of us are uh, Southeast Asians and our families had some trouble wrapping our minds around donation because we, we didn't know what the entire process was about. And uh, there were uh, some mixed feelings about her having registered, but um, the gift of, of being on that registry is a really eye-opening um, thought that um, can bring tears to the lives of loved ones, even though it may not be initially what was thought as being within line of, of a tradition or a, a religious belief. Um, and I'm going to just share with you what does it look like on the other side of the curtain, because I'm sure many of the students have walked the halls of a hospital, but you know may not be aware of the life-saving opportunity that exists. And uh, what, I, what I would like to start out with is where a donation after death actually begins, and that's before the death occurs. And the reason is because the, the body decomposes, and um, although we are animate, we are vibrant and full of life-saving power, uh, we are only able to create donation after passing away through a very carefully plan process and oftentimes um, a testing that needs to occur well in advance of the time of recovery. So how does that actually happen? Well, that happens with a referral, which is made by the hospital. Uh, and that's a requirement by uh, Centers for Medicare Services, as Stephen said, very uh, highly regulated and, and sanctioned by the, the government. Uh, and the um, referral helps allow for some consideration of criteria. Um, first, neurologic criteria of um, death by neurologic criteria or uh, by a family member's decision for allowing natural dying if there is no hope for life-saving potential. At that moment, uh, the referral process takes uh, effect. And the approach will occur around this time as well. And it's very important that a trained family specialist from One Legacy shares this important opportunity because it's oftentimes a bittersweet moment. The families are saying their goodbyes and 
are aware that death is imminent. But in the case that an individual has given their consent through the Donate Life Registry, or their family members have interest in creating life after their loved one has uh, deceased uh, through donation, this can end up being a different perspective a family hasn't received for weeks, or it could be months. As Dr. Shaw shared, uh, it can be years of, of living with a terminal illness, uh, and these families have the opportunity shared with them in a matter of minutes to hours uh, at a time where they have possibly uh, given up hope. After uh, consent, recovery only occurs after death, after someone has passed. And uh, we um, oftentimes have to remind families that um, the, the body is something we don't take with us uh, even if we wish for it. Uh, our body is not going to be intact. Our body will go through a state of decomposing and it's um, just a, a very selfless act for a donor to allow their organs, um, eyes and tissues to bring sight, uh, bring recovery and bring life uh, through a donation um, after death. Uh, the family support goes way beyond just a letter here and there. Communication is so important with uh, between recipient and donor families, but uh, there are arrangements made by the family support uh, group through a One Legacy that allows for knowledge about how the matching occurred with their loved one's organ gifts and also how donor remembrance ceremonies can help uh, them come together uh, with other families who have given generously uh, in a selfless way, even without knowledge of whether there is any return of gratitude. Uh, these are uh, really uh, moving tenets of, of um, uh, many religious uh, 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 groups, but uh, the families that share will oftentimes give a story of their loved one having had their life cut short before they could see a graduation or uh, a child who had uh, lost their life uh, from violence, uh, but yet on the other side uh, are, are now uh, celebrated with a le legacy of, of life-saving donations. So uh, it is just amazing to see um, our Southeast Asian donor families come together and tearfully share how they were able to create this realization of hope and uh, moving forward and spreading the word. And uh, with that, I'd like to just uh, say thank you, um, Brianne, for giving us the opportunity to help spread this life-saving opportunity. And uh, Donate Life is where uh, any individual can go to make their uh, decision and uh, share of their opportunity to donate uh, after, uh, after death. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Kendall and Stephen Chow. I just appreciate all this valuable information, and I sure, I'm sure that we're going to have uh, a number of questions related to your work as we come to the end. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Prafula Shaw, who is Secretary of the Jain Hindu Organ Donation Alliance in the United Kingdom, also Organ Donation Ambassador for the National Health Service in the UK. Prafula is going to share with us about the origin and work of this organization. And Michelle, could you put the link uh, for Jain Hindu Organ Donation Alliance in the chat? And I believe I might have also given you a link for Max and Kira's law, um, which is the new law in the UK. Um, and so if you have that, you can place it as well. Um, welcome, Prafula. Um, as we keep going, everyone, uh, add your questions to the chat and we'll get to those after this last speaker. Welcome, Prafula. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Brian and the team for inviting me uh, to talk about our work um, at the Jain Hindu Organ Donation Alliance uh, in the UK. Um, I was just going to say to you, I was promoted to chair of JOD recently um, and have actually got a personal story that is connected to organ donation. So I'm a living kidney donor, uh, donated my kidney in 2018. I'll talk a bit about JOD, um, our history, our work, how we work with the um, organ donation community here 
in the UK and also the NHS Blood and Transplant Organization. Um, so JOD was formed in 2019 uh, in the Houses of Parliament in the UK and it was the brainchild of a couple of people um, and the person that um, is sort of instrumental in making this happen is a gentleman called Lord Jitesh Gadia and he is a patron of our charity. So we are a established charity in the UK okay? and we work across organ donation, stem cell and also um, uh, blood donation. For organs, we work in partnership with NHS Blood and Transplant, both on the living donation projects, but also donation in death. As has been mentioned by a number of speakers here today, uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of reasons why there's such a shortage of organ donors from South Asian communities specifically. And so that is the community we target in the work that we do, but we do work with mainstream communities as well. Our project is national um, and we have taken our messages across the UK. Uh, so from in London, Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, uh, West and East Midlands. And then this year, we're also going to start some work in Wales um, as part of our new project. Our work is uh, about celebrating some of the um, Jain and Hindu traditions and events. So. We've run things like the Valley Arts Competition. Uh, we've done a play about organ donation. We worked with some South Asian musicians to produce a, a, um, a piece of music. And we've also done something uh, called Rangoli, which is um, Indian art, uh, uh, to actually depict organ donation. So a lot of really innovative ways in which we talk about organ donation and our work is all about normalizing that conversation about organ donation. We have some partnerships also with um, a couple of hospitals here in, the, in, in London. So the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead in London and the Hammersmith Hospital, which are two major transplant centers. We also refer to organ donation as a public health emergency and so work with uh, some local authorities. Um, and here in North London, where I am, we work with the London Borough of Brent and the London Borough of Harrow. We have done some work with London City Hall and the Mayor of London uh, in uh, raising awareness for organ donation as well. We have one very simple vision, uh, which is that no one should be dying waiting for a transplant in the UK. Um, our charity has some well-known patrons and we've gone down this sort of route of uh, working with lots of influencers in the community to get our message out there to the community. So Lord Gadia, who was, of course, uh, instrumental in setting up JOD in 2019. Uh, uh, our other patrons are Professor Sir Nilesh Shamani. He is a heart uh, specialist. Navin Kundra, he's a music composer and uh, very, very popular with lots of young people. And then Nishma Gosrani, uh, OBE, uh, she is a finance uh, advisor and does a lot of really good work in the communities that we, we talk to. Uh, we have some trustees, and I was saying earlier, I have just taken over as chair of uh, the Jain and Hindu Organ Donation Alliance, supported by Professor Sejal Saglani, who's the vice chair. Uh, we have our secretary, Bharti Bika and then supported by Dr. Sunil Daga, is a nephro nephrologist in Leeds, uh, and Jay Patel, who has an incredibly powerful story to tell about organ donation, having donated his son Ari's organs. Ari was only two and a half when they donated his organs. Um, the impact of COVID and the change in law to opt out, which Priyam mentioned earlier. So in 2020, um, England changed to a um, opt-out law for organ donation, which effectively means by default, everyone is an organ donor unless you opt out. This happened in the middle of the pandemic and it has had a profound effect on uh, how the law was actually, law change was actually received. We have lots of information and research to tell us actually hasn't had a very good impact on some communities and uh, last year, number of people waiting on the uh, transplant waiting list in the UK was 6,959. 
uh, that has actually gone up this year. And um, although transplants are at a five-year high, a uh, number of people donating has dipped by 19% for disease donation and 8% for living donations. Consent rates in the UK have also uh, gone down. And so for 65% for white families, but for ethnic minority communities, it has dipped to 32%. Of those waiting on the um, transplant waiting list, one third are uh, from ethnic minority communities. And as has been referred to by another speaker this evening, there is an imbalance in that there is a greater need for um, shortage of donors coming forward to donate. Last year, over 1,000 families in the UK did not consent to donation. And what that means is, uh, you know, lives were not saved when they could have been saved. And there are a number of reasons for why this has happened. Um, this is why JOD exists, the um, you know, reasons why we are doing the work that we are doing and uh, looking at these graphs year on year, there is very little change and the need still remains. Uh, there is a colossal need. And so all the work that we do in the community is very much with this message in mind. So in the UK, um, organ donation is handled, managed by a national organization under the auspices of the NHS called the NHS Blood and Transplant um, Organization. And every year they run a community grants program. So this is the fifth year that they are running this program. And effectively, it means that some community organizations are funded to run projects in the UK, and we are one of those organisations uh, that has uh, received funding through um, grant bidding uh, to do this work in the communities. And there are many reasons for this as well. NHS Blood and Transplant don't really have the connections in the communities that we do. They're not, um, you know, able to talk to some some of the communities. There's a language barrier. There is uh, the faith element, the traditions and the cultural elements. So uh, communities are best placed to work in the communities. It's certainly that, uh, something the NHSBT recognises and encourages um, people, uh, organisations like JORD to do this work. We have projects, uh, as I was saying earlier, for living donation, stem cell and disease donation. So we work across all three, and more recently, we've also started working on blood donation. Our living donation project with the Royal Free Hospital was a joint project, also with the Seventh Day Adventist Church um, as a partner. So we not only reach the South Asian communities, but also people of Black heritage, uh, and effectively, that that project meant that the patients attending low clearance, low clearance um, clinics. Uh, at the transplant center, Royal Free were given one-to-one -one support by our coordinators, working with the clinicians, um, and then sharing information about living kidney donation. That project has resulted um, in us having 92 uh, 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 92 people that we have supported in two years uh, going through a living donation process. Uh, as I said, you know, very much about one-to-one -one support uh, for the Hindu and Jain patients, but also those from the Black heritage communities. We've held community events about living donation uh, where um, a community may be celebrating a, a, um, an event or uh, uh, we've been invited by the church uh, led by Edith to actually do some work in the church as well. We have produced some culturally sensitive information, leaflets and videos, uh, and we do have people who speak uh, more than one language, one Asian language to actually communicate with, with these people who's, uh, who may be in the situation where English is in their first language. For stem cell, um, and it was really good to hear that story um, today, uh, and that uh, I worked on a very similar project in the UK, uh, for my cousin's son called the Help Veer campaign. Uh, and Veer did receive his transplant uh, uh, some years, two years ago, uh, and he's doing very well. So our project is with uh, Anthony Lo Nolan in the UK, 
uh, led by a JOD trustee, and we're very much focusing on reaching young people and students with this uh, project. And we've already held two really large events at um, Navratri, which is, you know, the nine day festival of dancing. And Anthony Nolan have trained uh, some JOD members to actually um, do the swabbing drives as well. For deceased donation, a lot of our work is based on relationships uh, with donor families and those waiting and writing up their case studies and uh, advocating for them. We built relationship with media and online platforms and we've established some really uh, very strong links uh, with NHS clinical teams, both um, in London, but also out of London in Leeds, Manchester and Birmingham. We have some international links in India and Kenya uh, through a project called the Tribute to Life Project. Uh, and we are doing some work in India specifically through this, this project. And our work, um, as I was saying earlier, is very much about getting influencers to talk about uh, organ donation and the idea that we need to normalize this conversation. So we do work with parliamentarians in the UK, but also some influencers specifically like DJs or music producers. And we do have 300 community leaders who we talk to regularly. So the pillars of our um, disease donation work is the five Bs. As I was saying earlier, this is about building trust in the community busting some of the myths, building sustainable partnerships, better information and awareness, and boosting engagement and registrations onto the donor registry. Now, you may say, why are we doing that when actually the law is very clear that everyone is by default an organ donor? And I'd like to go back to what I was saying earlier about the law change and uh, why it hasn't uh, worked particularly well for some communities. And what's uh, basically happened is because people are automatically thinking, oh, I'm an organ donor anyway, they're not actually having that conversation with their families uh, to let them know what their wishes are. And so if they're in that position where they can help somebody else by donating organs um, and, you know, they're in a very difficult time in their life, they have a loved one who is, uh, you know, about to, about to um, lose their life, because they don't know and they haven't had that conversation as a family, often families are not giving consent. And so from that perspective, the law change has not made that much of a difference in some communities. In fact, we've seen an increase in opt-outs from some communities as well. So um, talking about busting the myths, so we often hear a lot of people say, oh, my faith doesn't allow it or Culturally, they don't have all the information that allows them to make the decision. And so we have um, a piece of work we have done around sort of sharing the facts about organ donation, uh, sharing the, the information as we have it and the accurate information that we have. And we do have a lot of resources that have been specifically created for our communities uh, we've also built a lot of sustainable partnerships with other community organizations and so very much have become the trusted voice in the community when we talk about organ, stem cell or blood donation. Uh, we've found that actually better information helps to raise awareness and often the education and awareness isn't there and that's why there's this problem of people not coming forward and donating. Uh, last year, we had an absolutely amazing year. We've uh, had about 300 plus registrations with social media reach of about 55,000 people and some amazing unique engagements. We are out and about always talking about organ donation with a range of people. We've got some community champions who we have trained, uh, but also our trustees and our steering group are very, very active members of the organization. Uh, recently, we have uh, uh, developed a new approach working with the NHS Blood and Transplant and other organizations in actually clarifying the messages a little bit more around opt-out and why it's still important to register your decision. And this idea that actually the right message by the right messenger still um, resonates and we still need to do that. We do a lot of work with faith communities in the UK um, and have spoken at 
conferences about our work to do with Jane and Hindu communities specifically. And we have a very clear call to action, which is included in all our campaigns, and that is no one needs to die waiting for a transplant in the UK. Uh, we will continue to work um, in partnership with others and build this partnership. We do believe the challenges can be met um, and George fundraises um, on its own as well to do some of the work that we're doing out in the community. This is our website. So um, if uh, people want to go and visit it, it's at jhod.org.uk. And there's a lot of really good information there uh, both uh, specifically designed for our communities, but also the NHS reports um, on organ donation. And this can all be found in one place. You can also register on the organ donation register here uh, through this website. Uh, I'm going to stop there and um, just share a little bit about my own uh, work and why I'm involved with this work. So as I said, said earlier, I have donated my kidney uh, to my niece Shakti in 2018, and that's when I really became interested in this work. Uh, I became an NHS blood and transplant ambassador, first of all, and then in 2019 was asked by George to join them. Uh, thank you very, very much, Brian and the team for inviting us to share our work with you. Uh, and absolutely, the first, very first few slides tell a very similar story in the UK as well. We have um, uh, we have a greater need than availability of organ donors, and that is the imbalance we are trying to um, overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Prafula. Uh, we're going to turn to our questions now so that we can get to as many as possible. I'm going to just open up our Q&A, and I'll try to kind of combine message, uh, questions together. Um, And let's see here. Uh, one question that I have while I'm looking through these questions is if uh, for both for Prafula and for Dr. Kendall is the question of myths. What are some of the most um, the most common myths that you find that you need to address um, with different communities? And I'm just going to invite everyone to try to keep your answers as brief as possible so we can get to as many questions as possible. Rafula, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. So one of the things I we hear a lot um, in the UK is what will the body look like afterwards? Because a lot of the community that we work with have open casket funerals and they really worry about this. So we try and reassure them about what the how the uh, how the process uh, takes place. So we have transplant surgeons who come on uh, on our talks with us to talk about this and how the uh, donor is afforded so much dignity. So the funeral can still happen in the normal way. The other question I get a lot is um, my faith doesn't allow it. So we talk a lot about the um, principles of seva in both Jainism and in Hinduism. So selfless seva, you know, doing something good for others, uh, a benevolent way of actually helping somebody. And of course, uh, a lot of our communities will have cremations. So we also talk about that in terms of your body is going to turn to ashes. Actually, the organs will help somebody to save their life. Um, so those are some of the things we do here quite a lot. And uh, very good points. I'd add to that. There is sometimes the concern that donation in some way starts before someone has truly passed on. And uh, the whole concept of brain death is very difficult for many families uh, to wrap their minds around. Uh, but um, the fact is, you know, since 1968, the inception of, of legal donation in the United States, uh, there has not uh, been any donation before death in deceased donation and uh, not just not one case. Uh, so, but a lot of families have trouble contemplating their loved one being in a uh, neurologically deceased state. That's a very difficult concept, even for those who have some medical education. The other myth I think is that 
there is some incentive uh, for the hospital or some kickback uh, that is received as a result of a decision to donate. Uh, as Stephen Chow shared, uh, the federal government uh, at the in the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. are very careful to make sure that it is regulated and that the uh, wait list is not weighed based on somebody's ability to pay for uh, health care. Uh, it is a very fair process that the uh, United Network of Organ Sharing in the U.S. Uh, takes on uh, to make sure that um, it's fair, but there is also no compensation, uh, not even a dollar. So those are uh, two, two myths that I think are uh, just as, as common. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Um, Dwayne, I'm going to have you, I'm going to read another question now, but I'm going to ask you if you would promote uh, Dr. Lee Turner into our panel, uh, who can ask a question in a minute. Um, Dr. Shaw, I see your hand, so we'll go to you right after this question. Um, I believe that we had a question from a student, Emma, but I think you already answered this, Prafula. This was about um, that the increase in people who needed organ transplants, why is it increasing if there's a law in place? And I believe you helpfully gave I, what I thought was a valuable information that actually this, the conversations need to continue happening, even if there is a law. Um, yeah. Uh, Raymond asks, uh, with opt-out programs spreading, is the United States looking to also become an opt-out country? And uh, what are the hurdles to that? Uh, Dr. Kendall, is this something that you might have insight into? Sure, I can say that um, it is something that has been reviewed. Uh, the merits of uh, opt-out are that everyone has their their wishes shared and their family don't have to be on the spot at the, the very last moment, you know, in a very difficult time. Um, but um, the, this is a free country, you know, and there are a lot of reasons why the, um, the mothers and fathers of the gift law in uh, the United States did not um, uh, decide to create an opt out. Um, our um, Vice President of uh, External Relations, Tom Moan, actually published a paper on opt-out. And uh, if you uh, look that up, uh, you'll, you'll find that there is um, a good ethical analysis of the option. And it uh, is something that I think is contemplated, but it is not very uh, close to becoming uh, law. So I hope that, that helps answer your question. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, if you're there and happen to be able to put the name of that author in the chat, that'd be great. Dr. Okay. Shaw, your question? Uh, well, I wanted to make a comment that as, a, as an intensivist, I work in the ICU for many, many years. And uh, I think it is also ICU physician dependent when patient has brain death uh, to kind of prepare them, help them, etc., and go to one legacy and things like that. Uh, it is not uh, very easy. Some, at least my boss was of a Christian denomination. He will just not do this. He will actually, fortunately for the patients and families and the donors, he will just pass on the patient to me or my colleague, Dr. Shire, and will take care of whatever. And there is one other thing I'm sure Dr. Kendall is well aware. Uh, something that has come up of late, I would say in the last 15 years, is declaring cardiac death. And I've been personally involved in uh, some of those. And uh, that's a very, very good thing that has come about where your brain is not exactly dead, but it's not functional. It's not expected that you will walk out, but your heart is still beating because of the part of the brain that is functioning. And they also have been able to donate if the family wishes. Thank you. Dr. Kendall, do you have a response to that or anything you'd like to yes. Uh, Dr. Shah, um, you, uh, you're very right. In the last 15 years, that has uh, taken a, a large effect in the UK. Donation after circulatory death has overtaken donation after neurologic death. And we are seeing that happening before our eyes in the next uh, five years that is expected to occur. And uh, that does um, you know, raise the complexity, but uh, you know, it, it means um, that we need to be even more prepared 
for uh, misconceptions and the need to to educate others. And so uh, it's very pertinent. I think that uh, the Jain um, donation, uh, Jain and Hindu uh, communities are uh, trying to you know spread the word and make sure that people are educated and and aware because uh, this is a changing dynamic. My late wife was one of the first uh, donation after circulatory death uh, donors uh, just 13 years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And just on that point, uh, student Ava is just says that as a donor uh, herself, she's really grateful for this reminder of how important it is to educate uh, ourselves and those around us about the importance of donation. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Lee Turner, who is a professor in the School of Public Health at UCI, also the director of one of our co-sponsors, the new Center for Health Ethics, to ask a question. And I think this question will apply um, uh, both to Prafula and uh, uh, Sid Anwar. Uh, Mr. Anwar, if you're still here and have any thoughts, and Dr. Kendall, you might as well. Welcome, sure. Lee, to your partnership. Um, thank you. Um, thanks so much for uh, today's panel session and um, for everything we've heard. Really appreciate it. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge, I mean, several of you could have described personal experiences of loss that uh, were in some respects your entree to this subject. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so I, I had just a kind of a, you know, practical question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a health sciences context here. And um, I was just curious in terms of, you know, has there been much um, program evaluation research that has taken a look at different organ tissue cell donation campaigns and related efforts to try and figure out, you know, what kinds of initiatives have positive responses and which ones you know, they might, they're presumably well-intended, probably a lot of thought has gone into them, a lot of effort, but they haven't worked as well. And so there are probably some straightforward responses that, and we've heard that already in terms of, you know, working with community representatives, being attentive and respectful to the needs of particular communities, acknowledging linguistic and cultural differences and so forth. But beyond those points, you know, what else should initiatives focusing on particular ethnic, religious and cultural communities try to address? Um, what should they focus on? And I'm and I'm raising this sort of assessment program, evaluation, trying to figure out those differences because I mean it does occur to me that that shift from a, you know an opt-in donation framework to an opt-out model, where a lot of thought went into that, a lot of policy discussion, uh, some evidence you know that that was evaluated before that uh, shift took place, and that looks like an example of where there's a well-intentioned intention policy shift that hasn't really worked out as well as expected. Um, and so just kind of asking this question in terms of like, what kind of evidence base do we have and what kind of practical lessons can perhaps be gleaned from that? I think in the UK, um, the, the, the law change came at possibly the worst time ever because it was in the middle of the pandemic and uh, to be honest, a lot of the plans and it just blood and transplant had to prophesize it uh, probably didn't happen, uh, couldn't come to fruition. Post-pandemic, uh, there was a lot of other challenges to be met as well in terms of people getting back up to speed and, you know, transplants had stopped um, during that period. So getting back uh, to some sort of a, a, a basic level was also probably a priority. What um, we have done is we have done some research um, through a temple community that we work with quite closely. And what that tells us is where we share uh, lived experiences of people who've been through the process to sort of almost normalize this conversation, those events have worked really, really well. Uh, where we've had somebody who stands up in the front of the, the audience and tells their story, so I referred to Jay Patel, our trustee earlier, uh, their story. So Ari was only two and a half years old. He had a, uh, an accident at home. Um, and as a result of that, um, he wasn't going to survive. Uh, Jay and his wife, Sina, decided to donate Ari's organs, saving five lives, including, including um, a little girl who received his heart. Um, obviously, the, the whole process is anonymized. They don't know who the little girl is. They haven't met her. But they did re receive a letter from the family thanking them. And when Jay tells that story uh, in, in you know, any capacity at any event, it absolutely has a profound effect on people. And we 
we've gone to, you know, we've gone to events where it's been a really uh, challenging conversation with the audience until Jay comes on to talk about the story. And then it, it just something happens. It's like a light switch. Um, and similarly, for living organ donation events, we have living donors who come along and tell their story, uh, including my own. And that really, really affects people because they see a real person in front of them has been through the process. So it actually isn't that uh, unusual. And you suddenly see 10 people in the room who are either a donor family or a living donor, and it suddenly changes people's perceptions. I would just um, add to that, uh, Prafula Shah is right. Um, the donor and recipient story is so moving and much more than just a pamphlet might be able to offer. Uh, but, um, you know, the, uh, the other 45% of Americans who are not registered, uh, those families, um, they may or may not uh, approve and they may decline. There is research uh, that uh, indicates that when a family is approached at the time of losing their loved one, they're in a state of mind of severe grief and oftentimes not ready to even think about giving. And uh, you know what makes a selfless act occur is sometimes just having heard about donation in somebody else's family story. And so uh, Mr. Turner, you are asking a really great question. And uh, I think um, the audience members, uh, UCI students who are learning about uh, cultural studies and religious studies, you have the power to create that tide of change. And, uh, you know, forming a, a student interest group at UCI, you know, creating a Donate Life uh, promotion campaign, um, it can have an effect uh, many years later um, at the bedside uh, when uh, that family is is uh, presented with that um, conundrum, you know we are losing someone, but there is the opportunity to create this legacy. And you know, have we heard about that before? And so that exposure is so important. Uh, and um, I think um, it's uh, worth exploring more. So great question, Mr. Turner. Uh, thanks, Professor. Um, can I add something? Yeah, yeah. Please do. And I also uh, yes, go ahead. Mr. Anwar. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the, both the parallels regarding somebody being there actually to tell a story that really makes a difference in terms of uh, how many people register, especially in, in our events. We are relatively new to this. We've been doing since Lina passed away about four years ago. Uh, and what we found was just putting a picture of line on the table uh, attracts a lot of people to just come and ask questions. And uh, because it's a lack of awareness, a lot of people really don't know how simple the process is and how easy it is to actually get into the registry. We are not asking people to donate at this time. We're just asking them to register. And as I said, only one in 500 to 600 people are called to, to donate. And at that time, they have decided you know, that they really want to do it. And then most people tend to do it. There's also another question about uh, uh, bone marrow. You know, uh, Yeah, it is uh, uh, done while somebody's alive. And it is a very, you know, uh, a little different than uh, stem cells where you just have a cheek swab here, you actually have to donate bone marrow. And it's an overnight process. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, you have to go into the hospital and uh, it, it uh, takes, uh, you know, a little bit more effort, but you're out of the, uh, you know, hospital the next day. Uh, actually, uh, two of Lina's friends out of the 19 that we know of, again, remember, this is a confidential database. So we don't really don't know how many have actually contributed from Team Lina, but these are friends that actually called me and said, uncle, I have, uh, I've been asked to donate. So two of them actually donated bone marrow, and uh, it was uh, you know relatively uh, simple. They've all come back. Uh, fortunately, they have had no reactions or anything, and they're doing well. And uh, if I have somebody like that actually attend an event and tell people that is very simple to do, either a stem cell uh, registration or even a bone marrow, a lot more people register into these events. And of course, I see a lot of opportunity that I can probably work with uh, uh, the uh, donor organization uh, to. Uh, spread our word also. Another thing I just wanted to mention uh, was that uh, right now in California, you have the option of uh, you know checking a box to see if uh, you want to donate your organs. Uh, fortunately, what happened was when Lina was alive, we were also thinking about how well it would have been if we had a box to check in. And fortunately, there was another patient up in Northern California. I just know his first name. I think it's Charlie, and he, he was also South Asian. And when he was going through exactly the same process, one of the state senators found about this 
and uh, the law was initiated uh, to to make this possible, and it has actually passed, and it's going to be effective. Uh, I think January first of two thousand twenty-seven, where you will have another box to check in, uh, along with donor registration to say whether you like to donate your stem cells. Once you check the box, the swap kit would be sent to you so that you can register into the registry. So that's the good news for us because a lot more people would have the opportunity to de decide whether they would like to register into the database because all we need is people to register so we can match with somebody in this world. And again, stem cells like organ donation has, does not really have a nationality, race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. You know, uh, So we are very open to anybody registering. We are not uh, specific to any race, religion, gender. Uh, so we have a lot more people who are open to come up and uh, register into, into this database. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for your uh, thoughtful responses, and uh, thanks, to Professor Donaldson, for organizing today's event. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. I think that actually, uh, Sidanwar, you answered one of, another of the questions, which was how was the stem cell uh, donation done? Which is that if you register, then you get a mail uh, kit, or you're at an event, so you get your cheek swabbed, and it's only if you have a match that you would then be um, have an option to move along in the process. And then you also gave some more information about the process of bone marrow donation, which is an overnight procedure. Another sure. question in our uh, queue is a sense of mistrust that some uh, possible donors might have, um, especially I think living donors about uh, infection or other negative effects that could come. And so you've talked something a little bit about some of the social uh, barriers to uh, entry for families or patients to become donors. And I wonder if you could speak at all about some of the medical barriers that people might have, such as uh, fear of infection or other kinds of health risks, especially with being a living donor. Um, I see a hand with uh, Stephen Chow and Dr. Kendall. Go ahead and share your thoughts. I, I just wanted to share that uh, Stephen um, uh, has his email out there to you all, and um, this this might generate some interest enough to come out to One Legacy to see how carefully a donation is um, is cared for and in donor families as well. Um, and with regards to infection, this is uh, probably the most sterile facility. Uh, where surgery occurs uh, and testing occurs. So um, as far as disease donation, I can answer and say that the FDA makes it extremely, extremely safe. Uh, but um, I think um, your question, I think, is appropriate for um, the other uh, two parties uh, to, to speak on. Great question. Uh, Mr. Anwar, did you want to offer a response? Your hand is still raised. Well, oh, sorry, that was for the last question, but uh, no, I mean, as I said, stem cells, uh, you know, registration is very simple. You know, there's no uh, thing about getting infected in that process. In terms of uh, actually donating bone marrow, again, it is in a hospital environment. Everything is taken uh, care of in terms of uh, making sure that you're not getting infected. And it's, uh, I think I'm not a doctor again, but it's a process where you just put a needle in to, to suck the uh, bone marrow out of the bones. And uh, again, uh, in terms of infection, I have not had any statistical information to say it's, it's a dangerous process. It's very simple. All the doctors agree and all the donors who have gone through the process have agreed about it. Uh, uh, Nitin, you can yeah, ask. well, as a, as a physician and I have anesthetized yeah. patients for bone marrow, it requires general anesthesia. But other than that, it is a painful procedure. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it is very safe and the infection chances are very, very minimal. Um, the risk of anesthesia are certainly there. But otherwise, uh, unless you are fit, they are not going to take your uh, bone marrow. So it is very, very safe otherwise to go through anesthesia and uh, donate bone marrow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah, for that. <laughs> it's better coming think, from a doctor um, than, than an engineer. <laughs> I think I'm just going to add something about my um, own experience having donated my kidney uh, and the questions I get when I do attend education evenings at the hospital talking about this. So people do worry about this because actually you're completely healthy, but you're going to have surgery. Um, and it is because it is, as you, as several of our speakers have said, it is in a clinical environment. You're, a lot of tests are done on you. And unless you're very healthy, you're not going to be able to donate. So you're still that 
uh, first priority in terms of, you know, looking after you first. But I do get a lot of people complaining or concerns about things like, um, so I've got one person I'm currently uh, supporting. Uh, it's a it's a mother whose daughter wants to donate her kidney to the mother, and the mother's refusing because she says the daughter would be able to have children afterwards. So you get questions like this from people. Uh, also, people worry about the financial um, situation, so they'll be off work maybe for a few weeks, eight weeks, uh, up to six weeks, uh, and what happens then? So in the UK. Uh, there is a scheme that compensates people financially if you become a living donor and you've donated to somebody in a, uh, you know, either a friend's family or another another way. I wasn't actually a match to my niece, uh, and we went through something called the UK Kidney Sharing Scheme. Uh, you sometimes hear it referred to as the pairing scheme. Uh, so effectively, basic, uh, basically explained, it's a kidney swapping scheme. Uh, that's run nationally in the UK. So I don't actually know who has my kidney and my niece doesn't know who she has a kidney from. But through this chain of events, so there were six people in this chain uh, when we donated, uh, when I donated rather, and on the same day. So six surgeries happened around the UK on the same day. So people do worry about it because it's still an operation. It's still surgery. It is a major operation and it is painful. So, but very, very safe. Absolutely very, very safe. Thank you all today for this, uh, for all these good uh, questions that you've brought and all of our speakers for helping to field them. I think it shows uh, how much more conversation there is to be had. As we come to the end of our time, I just want to extend an invitation to each of you who's joined us today to keep this conversation going in your own circles. If you'd like to be a part of planning a future event, Michelle is going to put the UCI Religious Studies website in and my email address in the chat now. Uh, please reach out. Uh, it's our hope that this will lead to other events um, or even a South Asian or a student community collaboration here or really anywhere in the country, as well as for all other donor communities. I also wanna thank each of our speakers, Prafula Shah, Sid Anwar, Stephen Chow and Dr. Kendall, uh, Dr. Nitin Shah, um, and to all of our partners as well, thank you for joining. And I wanna thank all of you for coming to spend this time with us, considering your role in donating a gift of life. Uh, go well, and thanks again for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. It was really it was a good learning experience for me also. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so you much. very much. Thank you all. Bye-bye.